right, uh, let's get this show on the road. Hello everyone, hope you're well. Welcome to another episode of Math 391, Differential Equations. Let's actually jump into it. We're almost at the home stretch. As of tomorrow's lecture, we will be done. That's the plan anyway. Um, so today, uh, the main thing we're going to be talking about is Fourier series. Um, of course, we do have an example to finish up for Laplace transforms. And tomorrow, the idea is we are going to uh, do the heat equation. And those are the last two topics. So we are going to start uh, chapter 10 today. So Laplace transforms, this is in chapter six. We're just doing a couple sections from chapter six. We're then going to jump to chapter 10. And we'll do a few sections from chapter 10. We'll do 10.1, 10.2, 10.4, I want to say. Um, and I think there was another one. Anyway, uh, let's actually jump into it. Last time we looked at the Laplace transform. One way to look at this was it was the generalization of a power series, the continuous analog to the power series. Um, this is its definition. Given some function f of t, you know, that function has nice properties such that this integral will converge. We say that this is called the Laplace transform of the function. It is a function of s. Um, I mentioned here when such a thing would exist. However, we know how to compute it for each different function via the definition, and it leads us to this table. We also see uh, point 18, and this table is actually pretty important as well. Point 18 is what allows us to compute Laplace transforms of the derivative of a function. Now, when we take that and we apply it to ODEs, especially of the linear kind, we hit both sides of the Laplace transform. Because it's an integral, you can distribute across sums and factor at constants. Um, essentially, you can take the Laplace transform of each term of a differential equation and rewrite it in the variable s and y. So once you do that, you get a linear ODE. It will turn into a polynomial equation. And the order of that polynomial will be the order of the differential equation. So a second order linear differential equation, you'll have an S squared term. If it's a third order, you'll have an S cubed term, et cetera. And it turns out you can just solve for Y here using algebra. And so that will give you the answer in the universe of Laplace transforms, in which case you go to the table and you kind of backtrack your steps to figure out what function of T would have given that function as a Laplace transform. This is called taking the inverse Laplace transform. Um, so we did some examples of doing that. At which point, I left you off with one example to do and some other things that we are going to need as preliminaries for the next section. So these I'm actually going to cover in the next section. These parts here I'm actually going to cover in the next section so I can actually uh, get rid of them. So hopefully you guys also looked at that so it's not going to so, I know this is messing up. It's messing up. Let me try again. I'm not sure why it's doing that. My pencil can go over there, but for some reason, the mouse doesn't want to go over there. I have no idea why that is. Anyway, so we wanted to try this for next time, uh, which is actually right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to start here. And hopefully you guys actually tried this. So now you can kind of see, uh, open back the chat box. Now you can kind of see uh, what this would actually look like. So here it was like compute the Laplace transform uh, where y is the solution of the initial value problem, blah, blah, blah. Um, you want to notice here, for example, that it never asks you to find the solution with respect to t. It just said compute the Laplace transform. Um, and so here you can stop when you get the answer as a function of s. So 
Um, if you didn't read that carefully and you were taking the fall 2011 final, you would have probably wasted a lot of time trying to get it back to T's because as I recall, this function was actually really difficult to get it back to the, the, the version of T's, the T variable. Anyway, what we can do is, as you may recall, uh, we can just jump right in to say set Laplace transform of Y equals Y. This means the Laplace transform of Y prime is going to be minus Y zero plus S times Laplace transform of Y. This is minus two plus S times big Y. This means the Laplace transform of Y double prime is minus Y prime of zero plus S times Laplace transform of Y prime. And this is going to be positive two plus S times minus two plus S Y. So this is two minus two S plus S squared Y. And of course, Laplace transform of zero is zero. So the ODE becomes two times the Y double prime plus seven times the Y prime and the Y prime is minus two plus S Y. So you multiply that by seven. And plus six Y. That's all equal to zero. At this point now you want to solve for the Y. So you take the Y as a common term, you factor it out to S squared plus seven S plus six equals. So that takes care of this guy, this guy, and that guy. And then the other guys, I'm going to move to the other side of the equal sign. Um, so I will get 4s plus 14 minus 4, so it's plus 10. So that's the 4s goes over, plus 14 on the other side, minus 4. So that gives you plus 10. And so now your y is equal to 4s plus 10 over 2s squared plus 7s plus 6. And this is our Laplace transform. That is what we were asked for. Yeah, so hopefully you uh, you guys got that. Did, did everyone get that? Does that agree with what you guys got? Yeah, well, at least Sophia did it, which is good. But you guys need to have done it. I mean, you have a test in a couple of days, so. Um, if you're waiting on me to write down all the answers, it's not going to go well for you. Um, so hopefully actually you tried that on your own and you got that. So uh, that is the end of Laplace transforms. Very important topic, definitely coming up on your final. And of course, it's definitely coming up on your second test as well. Um, now we want to go into Fourier series, but we are going to first do some preliminaries. So there are some things about trig functions, even going back to pre-calculus that I have to remind you guys about so that you can understand how we're going to build these things up and construct them. And so I want to actually start there. First of all, Fourier series is pronounced Fourier series, like Fourier, like right here, right? So again, it's another French mathematician. We, we happen to be featuring a lot of French mathematicians, it turns out. Um, uh, Another French mathematician, so his name doesn't necessarily pronounce the way it is spelled. Um, so he was a mathematician physicist, very influential. He did a lot to develop series solutions to ODEs, as well as Fourier series 
and studying heat and conduction using series and ODEs and PDEs. So really influential mathematician. Uh, you can find out some information about him there, um, but let's actually continue. All right, now before we study 4A series, as I mentioned, uh, some preliminaries. One, period of cosine and sine. You should know that the cosine of MX and the sine of MX have this period. This is something that you learned in pre-calculus, right? Two pi over absolute value of M, where M is the frequency. This is the uh, coefficient of X that is in the angle. Now some, we specifically, we're going to want to know, uh, deal with functions that have period two times L. So if I set two L equals to that, this means that my M would be equal to pi over L and I can think of the functions in this way rather, right? So cosine pi X over L, sine of pi X over L, and that'll give us trig functions, uh, pretty much the, the basic sine and cosine. However, we stretched it and we, we shrunk it or stretched it so that the period ends up being 2L. So instead of the period being 2 pi, it is now 2L. On top of that, we're going to want to be able to talk about cosines of sines where their period is 2L, but at the same time, we can vary the frequency. So this means we can have the cosine graph repeat a certain integer number of times within that length 2L. So I can have four copies of the graph appearing within 2L, and then you can think of that major copy as the principal period, and you can copy that over and over. So we would like to be able to talk about that, and all we can do for that is just multiply by N. So now we end up with the uh, cosine of N pi X over L and sine of N pi X over L, these are going to be the basic and fundamental trig functions that we're going to be using in this lecture. So it's essentially just looking at our cosine and sine and modifying them so that one, we get a period of 2L and two, uh, we can vary the frequency. How many, we can control how many copies of the cosine graph would appear within the length 2L. So for example, the cosine of three pi X over L that will be a function that repeats itself three times within a length of 2L, okay? So that's, that's what that means. So that's very important. Um, uh, so I'm going to be using these guys in formulas and I just want you to know why they come up. Why would I use those particular guys as the formula, et cetera? Um, all right, another thing, uh, the product of some formulas. These are the formulas here. Basically, you'll notice that it takes us from a product of sines and cosines to a sum of sines and cosines. Therefore, it's called the product to sum formulas. Um, you also have sum to product formulas, but the product to sum formulas are the ones that will be featured here. Those are gonna be the ones that are important. This is again, a topic in pre-calc. However, for whatever reason at City College at the very least, um, they're not really emphasizing the pre-calculus class. So you'll learn about addition formulas and half angle formulas, double angle formulas, all that good stuff, but you never really learn or deal with the product of sum formulas. So I just want to, to let you know that there are guys like this out there. They're very useful and they're at the level of pre-calc and I'm going to like prove one or two of them for you. Second, we need to talk about the balance integrals of the cosine and sine products. So again, I'm dealing with cosines and sines of things that look like, of angles that look like some integer constant times pi x over L. We are going to be concerned with integrating such expressions on a balanced interval, so from minus L to L. And it turns out that if you have the product of two cosines and you integrate from minus L to L, you will get zero in the case that M is not equal to N. You will get L in the case that M equals to N, but they're both non-zero you would get 2L in the case that M equals N equals zero. Um, product of sines, you'll get zero if M is not equal to N. You will get L if M is equal to N and they're both non-zero. You will get zero if M is equal to N and they're both equal to zero. Um, for a product of cosines and sines, it turns out you'll get zero no matter what M and N are. So these are three very important types of integrals that we are going to actually use to derive the uh, Fourier series of a function. And we'll, we'll get to what that is in a little bit. By the way, uh, just for the sake of completeness, I'm not really gonna test you on this, but I, just in case, 
on the departmental final. This could be something that could come up in a multiple choice context. So for completeness, I just put this in here. Um, when you take two functions and you integrate on, a, on an interval and you get zero, we say that those functions are orthogonal on that interval, right? So orthogonal is just a term that comes when you study inner products. Um, and the TLDR of it is uh, the standard inner product of two real valued functions, u and v, on the, on the, the interval alpha beta is just alpha to beta, the integral of that times the product of those integrals. Now, it turns out that this is a generalization of the dot product. And we know from the dot product in Calc 3 that when, or Calc 2, Calc 2 now as well, um, that if you take the dot product of two things, you get zero. So in general, if they're orthogonal, so in general, if you take an inner product of two things, however that inner product is defined and you get zero, you call those things orthogonal. And it turns out that cosines and sines are mutually orthogonal, which means whenever I look at two things like this and I take their product and do the integral, on a balanced interval, I will always get zero. So cosine and sine are, is, are mutually orthogonal functions on balanced intervals. Um, now, and again, that gives some context to you knowing that cosine and sine are off by an angle of pi over two, which kind of ties things together back in pre-calc, but whatever. Um, that's just, uh, I, I'm not really gonna test you on that, but uh, it's something that you should know. Um, that definitely, at least what it means to be orthogonal. Okay, um, now let's look at the last two guys, this product to sum formulas and the balance interval uh, a little bit more closely. So let's look at the product to sum formulas. So here they, here they are, here are the addition formulas. So these guys you know very well from pre-calc, they are usually beaten to death in pre-calc. So you have the addition formula for cosine, the and and the addition formulas for sine with plus and minus angles respectively. I just numbered these because I'm going to be using them. Um, now I'm not gonna derive all of them, but I'm just going to show you how they kind of come up. Um, if you were to look at, so for example, Let's say I added three and four, right? So I look at these two here, the sine of A plus B and the sine of A minus B. Let's say I added those two equations. So if I take three plus four, I would get sine of A plus B plus sine of A minus B, and that would be equal to the sine B cosine A's would cancel because they have opposite signs. And then I would have two times sine A cosine B, which is, as you'll notice, is the first equation up here. Two sine A cosine B is equal to this sum of cosine functions. And so just by adding the addition formulas, adding or subtracting different pairs of addition formulas can give me these formulas. And again, I can do something like divide by two if I want to. So I can think of a product of sine and cosine um, as one half times the sine of this angle plus the sine of that angle. And as you can probably guess, knowing how to write a product of trig functions, like a product of sines or a product of cosines or a product of sines and cosines and writing it like this, is going to be very useful in doing these integrals here because you will notice that if you try to do integration by parts here, which is what the typical Calc 2 student would probably try, you would not be able to get to the answer. Everything will cancel out on both sides of the equation and you'll get some like zero equals zero if you try to do these by integration by parts. So um, the trick for these guys, quote unquote trick, is the product to sum formulas. Rewrite the product of these integrals as a sum and then you can actually compute them which leads us to the next part right here. Okay, so I'm going to go through the first and the third of these ones. So this integral and the mixed integral. Um, of course, the middle integral is very similar. Okay. So say I wanna prove these guys. And at the moment, let's focus on the first one. So let's move this out of the way. Okay. 
Let's say I want to prove that is true for all M and N. So uh, first of all, um, notice that if M and N are equal, then we would have this guy, say N pi X over L sine of N pi X over L dx. You will notice from the double angle formulas, in fact, um, if I go here and I plug in, say, A equals B, then it collapses into that product. So that's another thing you would remember from pre-calc very well. The double angle formulas give me that this would be actually one half times sine of 2n pi So you'd end up with that. And now, um, if you integrate that, you get L over 2n pi times, you'll get negative L over 2n pi times the cosine. Between minus L and L. This is going to give you minus L over 4n pi. And if you plug in L, you will get cosine of 2n pi minus, if you plug in minus L, um, the cosine is an even function. So if you take the negative of the angle, it just actually gives you the positive angle. As well. It's the same as cosine of the positive angle. And so here you will get zero, obviously. Now, if your m is not equal to n, okay, now I would apply the formula. So I would go up here, look at one of these products of some formulas of say a mixture of a sine and a cosine. Let's use the first one. So I'm going to apply the first formula which I showed you that you can add equations three and four to get that formula. So I'm going to apply that formula. And so this gives my integral I, let's call this guy I, is going to be equal to one half times integral from minus L to L of the sine of M plus N pi X over L plus the sine of M minus N pi X over L X. Then I can integrate both of these guys. And so this is going to be one half times. And I mean, it should be obvious here that you would get zero because the sine is an odd function. Um, let me just write that. I'm, that's a fact I'm actually gonna use later, so I might as well remind you of it now. And so since sine is an odd function, the integral from minus L to L of the sine will give you zero. So again, I gives you zero because we're just integrating a sine function on a balance interval. That's something you would have learned in Calc 1. Okay. So um, it turns out that this is always equal to zero. Challenge accepted and defeated. Okay. All right, so that's not so bad. Um, this one is a little bit more interesting though. OK. 
Okay. Now, if I wanted to prove this, again, call this guy I, and we're going to do each case. Um, case one, where M is not equal to N. What I would do is I would apply the product of sum formulas. Now I want just a product of cosines. That's the middle one here. So I'm going to apply that guy. And so what that's going to give me when I apply it to the integral that I care about this is going to mean that I is going to be equal to, well, one half times integral from minus L to L of cosine of M plus N pi X over L plus cosine of M minus N pi X over L. Now that is going to be well, it's going to be double the integral from this to L because uh, cosine is an even function. And this is since Something's really up with uh, my OneNote today, and I don't know exactly what it's complaining about. Why you no work, OneNote? And this is really not the place where you want OneNote to work. Um, the theory is just the part that you just want to get through, <laughs> and then, <laughs> because, you know, uh, a lot of students are going to be losing interest in all that kind of thing. So, uh, especially at this day, needs the human attention span just keeps getting shorter. So, all right. So I think we're back now. This guy, this is since cosine is an even function. This is again something that I'll mention later. You integrate an even function on a balance interval. Um, that is the same as finding it's double the integral on half that interval. Anyway, so here, once I start integrating these guys, I would get something like, well, L over M plus N pi sine of M plus N pi X over L plus L over M minus N pi sine of m minus n pi x over l between zero and l. This guy here not equals zero since m is not equals to n, so we're good. And now I just start plugging guys in. And of course your m and n here were positive. I mentioned that in the notes here. So, which is why this is not zero. Um, M n greater than or equal to one. So, M plus n not equal to zero. Now, when I plug in L, I just get L over M plus n pi sine of M plus n pi plus L over M minus N pi sine of M minus N pi. And when I plug in zero, I get zero. Now we know, hopefully we know, that the sine of an integer multiple of pi is zero, sine of an integer multiple of pi is zero. And so we would end up with a zero in this case. And you will notice that that is what we should have gotten. When M is not equal to N, we will get zero. What about if M is equal to N and they're non-zero?
So this means that my I is going to be equal to the integral from minus L to L of cosine n pi x over L times cosine n pi x over L dx. I can apply the double angle formula for uh, cosine. Um, so this is minus da da da, this is cosine squared of n pi x over L. We know how to integrate cosine squared. You rewrite it by the double angle formula. So this is one plus cosine of two n pi x over L dx. Now, of course, uh, this part is gonna go to zero again by another shortcut that we can use later on. So I'm just reminding you of a lot of little tidbits here. Um, we're integrating uh, cosine. It also works for sine uh, over an interval that is the length of its period. This is also something that you would have learned back in Calc 1, that this will always give you zero. So for example, if you take cosine x and you integrate from zero to two pi, you'll get zero. Same thing with sine x. Anytime you integrate on a length of, not necessarily its period, but any in multiple integer multiple of its period, you would get zero. Um, that is going to come in handy later on because as you'll see for this topic, you're going to have to do a lot of integration to be able to answer a problem. So knowing all your little shortcuts for integration is going to come in handy again. Um, so for example, if I were to integrate from pi to five pi of sine of x, I know that I would get zero. I don't have to actually go through the calculations because the length from pi to sine to five pi is four pi. This is an integer multiple of two pi. Two pi is the period of sine x. Therefore, I'm integrating over an integer multiple of the period, and therefore that would go to zero. So this guy really just collapses into just the integral of one. So this is just going to be one half times the integral of x from minus l to l. This is, of course, going to be one half times two l, and that is just going to give you l. Now, if you look at uh, the, what I claimed it was supposed to give us, yes, you would see that it gives us L here. Now, in the event that case three, M equals N, they're both zero, then my I is just going to be the integral from minus L to L of cosine of zero times cosine of zero. That is of course going to just be one. And that is, of course, going to be x from minus L to L. And that is going to be 2L. And now you see that that is the last thing. So um, you can go through and you can prove this one, the product of two signs, and get all these guys in a very similar manner. But uh, that's enough of those integrals for now. So these integrals are now proven. So now we can actually use them. Um, we use these guys. So these guys thought we should have known from pre-calc. I needed them to prove these guys. And yeah. Now, with that said, where is that thing? Yeah. With the above integral formulas, uh, we, can, uh, we have the machinery to talk about Fourier series now. Now, I actually expect, expected to do this yesterday. So I have a note here saying that stay tuned for the next exciting episode, but uh, we are actually there right now. So now we know enough to attack Fourier series. So that was just some preliminary calculations that we would need. Now let's move on to Fourier series. Now, I will start by saying that one, Fourier series are cool, and two, they are highly applicable. If you don't believe me, here are some links to check out. These are some cool YouTube videos. One of them is by 3 Boo one brown one of my favorite math YouTubers. Uh, because he uses a lot of uh, nice math visualizations to explain math. And the other is just a guy, I believe he's an engineer. 
uh, don't quote me on that, but he just spoke about some very important applications of using Fourier series to kind of sketch out uh, random images. Um, and I think they actually used Fourier series to sketch a, a picture of Fourier, which is like very meta, but whatever. Um, very cool stuff there. Um, they're also highly applicable. Uh, there are some links here that talk about the applications of Fourier series. Um, of course, you'll see these in your future classes as well. And you'll see these, I guess, depending on what field you go into, you might see these all again in your uh, everyday life, um, depending on what you do with your life. Um, so I'm not going to talk about those because this is the math class where we just learned the math. Um, we don't really care too much about the applications. Um, I just want you to know what a Fourier series is and how to compute it. But uh, it's really cool and interesting stuff. And I leave these links here for if you want to watch something extra. You have uh, 10 minutes to kill. I think one of these videos is 18 minutes or something like that. The other one is like eight minutes. You have another eight minutes. It will be actually really cool stuff to check out. Now, here's the thing. Um, Fourier series can really approximate almost any function. Uh, it is kind of like what a power series does. So remember what we did with power series. And again, we did the, we generalized the power series to get a Laplace transform. Now we're not really going to generalize a power series. We're going to take the idea that we got from power series and apply it to something else. So the idea behind a power series was what? Polynomials are a really nice function. They're continuous everywhere. They're differentiable everywhere. They're integrable everywhere. Here's an ugly function over here, ugly in the sense that it's very hard for me to do calculus or computations with it. What if I could express it as a polynomial? Boom, you take that to its logical conclusion and a power series is what you get out. Um, so a power series was just a way to write functions as polynomials. And if the function itself is not a polynomial, then chances are you would need an infinite degree polynomial to actually write that thing down as a polynomial. Hence, you get an infinite power series. We want to apply the same idea. Um, and while you can actually do this for any function, just like how you can compute power series for a function, you can compute Fourier series for a function. Um, however, a Fourier series really shines when you apply it to periodic functions. So in general, if you have a random function, a power series is probably going to be the go-to series if you want to do a series representation. However, if you know that the function is periodic, then a Fourier series would be the go-to series. And you would know what? A lot of things are periodic. Um, so this is why Fourier series is um, important in, in optics, in harmonic analysis, in audio analysis, in signal processing, things where you just have a repeating signal going through. You want to study that. You want to modify that. You can use a Fourier series. When you do something like take an audio file and you compress it, what actually happens? Well, your audio program takes that file, translates the, the Muse sound waves into Fourier series, then it cuts off a part of the Fourier series and lo looks at it as a finite Fourier series where it reduces the number of terms, hence reducing the number of information, but it reduces not so much information that the sound will become unrecognizable. It reduces inform information, enough information so that the human ear won't be able to tell the difference, but then at the same time, it's a lot less information. So when you do something like compress a file, um, when you want to compress like a certain repeating uh, video file, which is just a repeating wave of light, or a, a sound file, which is just a repeating sound wave, you can use a Fourier series to do that. So that's just one practical example here. But when it comes to periodic functions, functions that repeat themselves, you can do this with Fourier series more generally, but it really shines with a periodic sense. Because when it's periodic, a Fourier series will converge to a function much quicker than a power series would converge to the function. So that also not only cuts down on the amount of information you have to transmit, but it cuts down on the amount of computation time that it would take for you to calculate that information. And because in uh, this day and age, we're literally calculating millions of bits of information, billions of bits of information, anytime you can cut down the time work, it's, you're going to want to do it. So in general, if you're in a scenario where a power series would probably be what you would go to, but you notice that things are periodic, then you should probably shelf the power series and take out the Fourier series in your toolbox. So this is kind of in the situation where you might want to use a Fourier series. Okay, so that's kind of why this is important, why you might want to study it. Um, so for our main goal 
is just to express a function that has a, that a, express a periodic function as a series of, well, sines and cosines. Why sines and cosines? Because sines and cosines are our favorite periodic functions. Just in the same way that polynomials were among our favorite functions when it came to calculus and computations, when, it, when we think about what is my favorite periodic function, sine and cosine, the, the guy that we first learned when we learned about periodic functions, these were the first two guys that we learned. Very nostalgic, very important, very fundamental functions. So instead of writing something as an infinite series of, of polynomials or power terms, we are going to write things as an infinite series of sines and cosines. Well, potentially infinite. It's possible to have a finite series. Okay, so here are some random curves. Notice that they're repeating pattern. Uh, let me make this uh, smaller just for a little bit. Uh, the first one is your good old sine curve. The second one is called a square wave. This one here, the jagged edge is called a triangular wave. This one here is called a sawtooth wave. So basically, we can have a wave like this and it could represent, I don't know, a laser, some kind of audio file, whatever. Something that's periodic is what's represented. Now, what I can do with this, what a Fourier series does is, the Fourier series of a sine series will be just the sine function, right? Kind of like how if you take the power series of a polynomial, you just get the polynomial back. So here, um, this is a sine is its own Fourier series. So, so nothing to do right there. The Fourier series is going to be the red curve. However, when you go away from a trig function like here, what would a Fourier series look like? Well, it'll take, try to approximate this green curve with a sum of sines and cosines. And so it'll start to be like wavy going down along the curve. And the more terms you use, the closer, the less jagged this curve will become and the more smooth and streamlined it will become. And eventually it will become so streamlined that to within a certain degree of accuracy, you won't be able to tell the difference between my Fourier curve and the original green curve, right? Um, and we just want to find in general, the least amount of terms of the power series of the Fourier series that we can use to get such an approximation. Similarly here, we might uh, start out with a, four, a sine series and your Fourier series just goes over this and it tries to match the function with a bunch of sines and cosines. So it starts out very wavy But the more terms you use, the better it gets. So the, this guy is the Fourier series approximation. It gets better with more terms. Okay. Now, and with the technical difficulty we're already having, I'm not sure I wanna actually show you these guys, but um, I might just actually risk it. Now, there are some times when you want to represent a wave like this, where it has discontinuities in it, like jump discontinuities. What happens with a Fourier series? If the Fourier series for such a function exists, what it does is the Fourier series would actually, um, in the middle of a jump discontinuity, it will take the average of the outputs and it will connect that as a point. So your Fourier series at the point of discontinuity will actually compute the average value of the left and the right discontinuity outputs. And so a Fourier series would look like this. Even though the, the original has a gap, the Fourier series will not have a gap. It will literally go through that point. Okay. And and you know what? I'm gonna risk it. Okay, so hopefully you can see this. This is my browser. This is the the Zoom room. Um, and here's a, a nice little animation. Now, if you look at this. That's the picture that I just showed you. And here is what successively larger terms of a Fourier series does, right? 
So this goes up to 50. Notice that once you get n equals 50, it's like you can't even tell the difference between the red line and the blue line anymore. It, it becomes so smooth, it's almost like a straight line, but it's not. It's really just a bunch of uh, sines and cosines that they're really oscillating, but they're oscillating so quickly and so with such small amplitudes that you can't really tell the difference. So that, that's a really cool animation. If I look over here, this is another animation. So this is like if I were to have that rectangle wave, the square wave. Notice here, the guys get, as, get, as uh, I take more and more terms of the series, the closer and closer it gets, the red line is really getting super close to the blue line um, to the point where if you zoom in here, eventually you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Right? So, so, that's actually, so that's actually pretty cool. Um, there are, are some, uh, if you look at the Wikipedia article, there are some more things here which kind of shows you how the sines and cosines come into effect. Because remember, sines and cosines create circles. That's how they were introduced to us in pre-calc, right? Track the coordinates around the unit circle. The x coordinate is a cosine, the y coordinate is a sine. So when I take an infinite uh, sum of sines and cosines, what you can look at this as is I start out with a circle, then on the radius of that circle, I attach another circle. Then on the radius of that new circle, I attach another circle. Then on the radius of that new circle, I attach another circle, et cetera. And once I send the yellow circle into rotation, it starts rotating everybody. And by doing that, it's going to trace out a curve. And the more and the higher the frequency, the thinner the curve that it traces out will get. And it ultimately comes down to here. And you, let, you can actually see this working. And this is how you'd like um, see something sketching out like a picture of anything that you want, really. So really cool stuff. Just thought I'll show you guys those animations um, because you know they're, they're actually really cool. So yeah, that's kind of how it would actually look. So if you're someone who's working with Fourier series, chances are you're going to have a program that it's going to have like three screens and you're going to be looking at images like this at some point where there's some wave over here that you're very interested in, which is a red wave in this case, and you want to approximate it with a, a blue wave, which is going to be the Fourier series. Yes, really cool stuff. At least I think it's cool, um, but yeah. So that is kind of what, uh, what we're doing with a Fourier series, right? So that's visually what is happening. We want to take some curve and approximate it with sines and cosines. Why? Because the curve is, periodic for one. So it makes sense to use sines and cosines instead of a regular power series. However, like I said, this can work in general for random things. What kind of series will we care about? Well, what kind of functions will we care about? Functions that have period 2L. So now you'll notice that for this function here, if I look at the length of this, this is actually 2L. So it branches off in one way, a distance of, uh, I'm looking at functions that if I were to center it at the origin, it will, in one direction, you can move a distance L, and then in the other direction, you can move a distance L, and then when you take that whole thing, you just have copies of that being repeated. So here is another copy that is length 2L, here is another copy that is length 2L, et cetera, and this keeps going, right? So we're going to be studying functions where we define the period to be 2 times L. So whatever the period is, I just define L to be half of that number. Okay, and this actually leads us to um, how we're going to actually build up our Fourier series. So let's actually, uh, oh, one other thing I did want to mention is that let's say you're, you, you can be given a piece of a function and then you're asked to actually extend it as a periodic function. So maybe the function that you're looking at is not periodic, but you do want to repeat it. So you have a, little, a small little sound file that you just want to run on a loop, for example. Um, there are many ways you can actually set that to repeat. So here, the blue part here is just some function that we care about repeating. We can extend it as an even function. So I just want to copy, flip it, mirror image in the y-axis, take this middle part as the, the, the principal period, and then copy that. This is saying I'm extending it as an even function. And it turns out that the Fourier series for that will only have cosines in it. So the Fourier series for that would be a cosine series, quote unquote. We'll talk about that a little bit later. If I took the blue part and flip it in the origin, um, this is creating an odd representation of a function. And if I repeat that, 
This is extending the function, quote unquote, as an odd function. And it turns out the Fourier series of this will only have signs in it. Therefore, it will be called a sine series. So this is because the cosines will control the even portions of a graph, while the sine will control the odd portions. And if something is neither even or odd, as in this down here, the Fourier series just takes that and copies down whatever picture it sees. And it will need both odd and even components to kind of balance each other out to get that picture done. And that's your general Fourier series right there. All right, so that's enough for just ranting about what Fourier series are good for, what they would look like, and why we would care. Let's actually get down to the nitty gritty. Let's talk about how would we actually find such a series. Now, the most general theory actually uses the exponential form of a Fourier, of a, of a Fourier series, and it uses a Laurent series, our old friend that counts down to negative infinity. However, and I include this link here because it has some more animations. I believe I showed you that already. However, for us, we're going to apply Euler's equation, remember e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta, to kind of break up this exponential function into sines and cosines that we can see as separate terms. And we're not going to look at Laurent series, we're going to look at regular kind of power series, starting from zero to infinity. So to represent a function as a sum of sines and cosines, this is the kind of expression I want to be able to do. Can I write f of x as this kind of series? a coefficient times a bunch of cosines plus a sums coefficients times a bunch of sines where my n is counting up. So I can add up different frequencies of cosines and sines to create this infinite wave of sums of sines and cosines, right? Now, you might notice that if I were to plug in n equals zero, the sine of zero is zero, so this second term disappears completely. And then the cosine of zero is one, so it would just give me a zero. So because the second term, the bn term, isn't present at n equals zero, normally what we do is we usually separate the a zero term and just write it like that. So we start our series from one and we write the constant term, which is the zero term separately, right? And so um, also, because of what I showed you a little bit earlier, when I was taking the calculation of a product of cosines and I got 2L as one of the answer, there's going to be this extra doubling of something that occurs in the calculations. So to make things nicer, we generally express the first, the constant term as a half of something, right? So we write it as over two, and this is for aesthetic reasons, really. There's, there's no mathematical backing here. We just write it as a half of some constant, just so that there's going to be a two that comes into play that is going to end up getting canceled by this half that we put in. And it, it just kind of makes things look a little bit nicer. So this is going to be, this is the guy that we are going to try to get, right? So this leads to the following. We say F as a Fourier series, if it can be written in this form, I can write F of X as being equal to some constant. And I really want to put that constant over too. if it can be written in this form. Okay, Whew. all right. So that's basically what we're getting. Now, just like with power series, you can't always find a Fourier series. Just like with power series, you can't always find, find a power series that represents a function exactly. In the same way for Fourier series, there are functions out there that you can't really find a Fourier series for. Um, however, we're not going to deal with that case of when you can find a Fourier series. That's, ten, that's dealt with in your text in 10.3. It's not in our syllabus. We're not going to cover it. But the TLDR of it is the function and its derivative needs to be piecewise continuous on the interval. And then we can find a Fourier series. All right. But for us, we're just going to assume that we, uh, all the examples that I'm looking at, we can find Fourier series for them. We also can assume that it will converge absolutely to this series because we're gonna to need to be integrating these series to figure things out. Um, so that is just something we're gonna take at face value. Just take it at face value that every example that I, you will see in this class will be something where the Fourier series exists. So you never have to worry about whether or not it exists. Second of all, you can always assume that the Fourier series, when it exists and converges to a function, the convergence is absolute, which means I can do calculus with the series. 
um, which is another thing you learned in Cal 2, but let's not get into that. Okay, now, uh, a series of length is as good as its coefficients. So for example, Taylor's formula gave us a way to find the coefficients of a power series, f to the nth derivative evaluated at the point over n factorial. This was a way to find the coefficients that would create a series that behaved, right? Um, and so when it comes to series, and we, find, we were finding series solutions of ODEs before, where what did we need to do to actually solve the problem? We had to find the coefficients. So you telling me this series exists is not good enough unless you tell me what the coefficients are. So now we have to know, okay, so I know that's a Fourier series for a function. How do I know what coefficients I need to pick in order to get that series? So that's what we're going to do. I'm gonna tell you, tell you how to derive the coefficients, the ANs and the BNs and the A naughts, right? So here's how we would derive the A naught, okay? What would the A zero be, right? And again, let me rewrite this as being over two. What would the A zero be? Um, well, here's what we can do. I can take this guy and I can integrate both sides from minus L to L. Uh, let me actually. So let's say I go here and I integrate. I just think I'm really misbehaving today. I probably need to restart my computer, but I uh, forget we're in the middle of a lecture and I'm gonna restart anything. <laughs> So every now and then I have to just come out and, and, and come back in. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation, assuming that my function can be written like that, I'm going to take that equation and integrate both sides from minus L to L. Of course, this is going to mean I can integrate from minus L to L of a naught over two dx plus the series from one to infinity of the integral of uh, minus L to L of a n cosine n pi x over L. Plus sine of n pi x over L. Now, this is okay uh, because of absolute convergence. So that so that is what makes this process here okay. Now it turns out that of course this is going to be zero and this is going to be zero because uh, the period, period of these functions equals two L and that's the length of the interval. So the trig functions automatically go to zero under this scenario. And so basically what we end up with is that the integral from minus L to L of f of x dx is going to be our uh, integral from minus L to L of a zero over two dx. I can integrate that. This is a zero over two times x between minus L and L. And this gives us a zero over two times two L. And now you see why we put that over two. It's literally for this reason. So I could cancel the twos here and have something looking nice. And so therefore, I can actually solve for my a zero by dividing both sides by L. And 
lo and behold, I now know what is my A0. So uh, that gives me my A0. Now, what if I want to find the ANs in general? Okay, so not necessarily the A0. Put this guy over two again. I, I was just copying this formula because I would, didn't want to type it over, over and over again. Um, I'm going to have to uh, change all those guys to being over twos. Anyway, now what I want to do is I want to find the an, the coefficients of the cosine. Here's what we can do. Um, we can multiply each part, multiply the equation by cosine n pi x over L, and then integrate. This is going to give the integral from minus L to L of f of x cosine n pi x over L. This is going to be equal to integral from minus L to L cosine n pi x over L plus series integral from minus L to L of a n cosine n pi x over L times cosine n pi x over L plus the integral from minus L to L of B n sine n pi x over L cosine n pi x over L. Now, it turns out that this guy here is going to be zero because we're integrating over a period uh, of Cosine. So this is just a constant times a cosine. That cosine function has period 2L. I'm integrating over an integer multiple of the period, uh, a length of interval that is the integer multiple of the period. So that's going to go to zero. Now, the integral of sine times cosine, that part goes to zero by preliminaries. That's what I explained to you at the beginning of today's class. Sine and cosine are orthogonal functions. So when I integrate a product of them on a balanced interval, it goes to zero. What's going to happen to this guy? Now, if you go back to the preliminaries and you looked at the product of cosines, you will notice that if I take a cosine times a cosine and my m is equal to n and it's non-zero, then the integral is just going to give me L. So this integral here is equal to L. And again, by preliminaries. I, I proved to you why this equals to L already. I proved to you that at the beginning of class. So now what you end up with is you end up with just uh, a n times L. right? Because this goes to zero. The, the integral of this part goes to L. And so that's just a constant that factors outside the series. A n is a factor constant that factors outside the series. And so the integral gives me that. And so my A n is just one over L, the integral from minus L to L of f of x cosine n pi x over L. Now, uh, I'm not going to derive it for you because I, we're already spending a lot of time deriving some basic formulas, but you can actually do the same thing for the bn. If you multiply both sides by the sine of n pi x over L, then integrate from minus L to L, you'll be able to derive the fact that your bn is going to be 1 over L, the integral from minus L to L of f of x sine of n pi x over L. And that leads us to da, 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 this guy.
So how do we find the Fourier series of a function? Suppose a function is 2L periodic, meaning it has a period of length 2L, and it has a Fourier series. That means we can write the function in this form. Again, I forgot the, the 2 there. Where the a0 is this integral, the a n is this integral, and the b n is this integral. So I have a series representation of sines and cosines of a function, but to find the coefficients of each of those guys, I need to do these integrals. And so to construct a Fourier series, you're actually it, it's actually an exercise in doing a bunch of integration, which is why I had to remind you all about all that stuff with integration earlier and how to integrate and why we need to know how to integrate these guys. All right. Now, shortcuts. There are some shortcuts that we can apply here. Everyone loves shortcuts, so let me tell you about some uh, shortcuts. Now, every now and then, we want to actually either um, find a Fourier series for an even function or extend it as an even function, or we want to find the Fourier series of an odd function and extend it as, or extend it as an odd function. And now, some other facts from calc one comes into play. Remember a function is even if f of minus x equals f of x, right? That's what it means. It also means it's symmetric about the y-axis, so you can visually tell when something is an even function. And even means if you're integrating on a balanced interval, you can just take the double of that integral on half the interval. So that's what you would know. So if you want to integrate cosine from minus a to a, what you can do is double the integral from zero to a of cosine. So that's something that we know from calc one, not gonna justify it again. Here, if f of x is odd, that means f of minus x is equal to minus f of x. That means you're symmetric about the origin, which means you take the right side, you're reflecting the y-axis, reflecting the x-axis, you get the left side. Um, that is an odd function. When something is odd, then integrating over a balanced interval will give you zero because the part from zero to a will be the negative of the part from minus a to zero the integrals are going to cancel out. So the integral of each side cancels out and you'll get zero. So that's something you should remember. Integrating odd functions on a balanced interval gives you zero. Integrating even functions on a balanced interval gives you double the integral and half the interval. You should also recall the following. If I take two even functions and multiply them together, the result is an even function. If I take two odd functions and multiply them together, the result is an even function. And if I take an odd function and an even function and multiply them together, the result is an odd function. Um, that's actually not hard to prove, and I'm sure you saw it in, uh, in Calc 1. Or not Calc 1, prior to that, I think. Okay, this leads to the following. Whenever you have an even function, there is a shortcut. Um, or should I? Maybe I should uh, actually show you this. So, for example, suppose f of x is even. Then this means that if I integrate from minus L to L, this function, it is going to be double that function from zero to L. So I can actually make my integration for the a zero a little bit easier. Also, my a n, which is one over L times minus L to L of f of x cosine n pi x over L. Again, this is even and that is even which means overall it's even. And so I can apply the same kind of logic. Double the integral from zero to L. So I, we can make this integral easier to compute. Now, what would your BN become? You'll notice that F of X times sine N pi X over L This is even, this is odd. 
which means the product is odd, which means this integral will always give you zero. So it turns out the, for an even function, the bn is always going to be zero. And so you don't have a bn part in your Fourier series. That gives you this. And hence, this is why we call the Fourier series of an even function, we call it a cosine series because only the cosines will be present. The bn's, the bn's are going to be zero. So you'd always have bn equals zero for an even function. And for the a's, you can double the integrals on half the interval. Now, for an odd function, something similar will happen. So if uh, f of x is odd, then what is my a zero? It's one over L integral from minus L to L of f of x dx. Well, if f is odd, that's zero. So I won't have that. Then if I look at a n, Here, I would have an odd function times an even function, which means overall, this is an odd function. And again, boom, I get zero. So it turns out an odd function will have no cosine parts to it because the cosines give you the even parts. Um, the bn's, however, will be non-zero. So in this case, this is odd and that is odd. The product of an odd and an odd is even, not integers, functions, right? Um, dx. So now that just becomes double from zero to L of f of x sine n pi x over L. And that leads to the second thing here. Okay. Now, if you have a sign of a function that's odd, its Fourier series is only going to have the sign components. The a zero and the a ends will always be zero. And your bn, you can actually get it by doubling up on the integral for half the integral. So in general, this is how you compute a Fourier series. However, in the case that you have an even function, you can ignore the b's and only compute the a's. And you can compute the a's on half the interval and just double your answer. If you have an odd function, ignore all the a's, only compute the b's, and you can double the integral on half the interval. So you'd realize that this would actually give you um, a lot nicer computations for a Fourier series. You don't have to waste your time actually going through the integral and then realizing that you get zero. You, you do all that work for nothing. Like why is that all that computation necessary? So this is going to be important because sometimes you're going to be specifically required to find an even Fourier series or a Fourier series of an even function or a Fourier series of an odd function or they're gonna tell you to extend something as an even function or an odd function. And you should know, you should ignore the A's or the B's as appropriate. And you can actually cut down on your computation. So th those are some shortcuts. <sighs> okay, lots of theories. Let's jump into some examples, finally. So pretty much I tell you everything that you need to know not only to solve a problem, but also enough to answer anything that could be asked conceptually about um, Fourier series. Um, so uh, you guys, I know I've been rambling for a while, but uh, I literally told you everything you'll ever need to know about this thing. Um, all right, so here's an example. So this is something we're gonna do. And again, for the first one, I'm going to actually just do go through it so you can see what I'm doing. And then uh, I'll ask you guys to help me with some of the other ones. All right, take a sip of my coffee here, ready to, ready to get into it. All right, everybody wake up, look alive.
stop washing your dishes or, or whatever you were doing when I was rambling and come back and, and look. <laughs> we're, we're going to do the examples now. All right, f of x is this function. It's a piecewise function. It describes a periodic function of period two. Find its Fourier series. <laughs> Z Kong is like, finally, <laughs> oh, punk. <laughs> All right. So in general, you don't have to sketch these guys, but I'm just gonna sketch it just for you to visually see what we're, we're trying to accomplish here. So my f is a function where from zero to one, it is the function two. Um, so at zero, it is equal to two and it goes over here and boom. And that happens from zero to one. Now from minus one to zero, uh, the function is actually zero. And from minus one, actually let me, so let me do the, the function in red. It is just a zero function until I come here and then it's going to be here. So this is a picture of the, the main portion of my function. Now, what we are doing is we're thinking of this as a periodic function, which means this pattern actually repeats. So um, it's going to start here, go over, boom, boom, go over, and start here, go over, boom, boom, go over, etc. Right. So then it's going to end up here, go back, close circle, open circle here, go that way, close circle, and it's repeating. Right, so that's our function. Um, the Fourier series, let's put that in blue. It's going to try to So maybe I should do that separately. So that was my original function. And right now here, I'm looking at what the Fourier series approximation of that function would look like. And it would just, uh, yeah, be a function that runs over, du -du -du -du. Du -du 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 -du. jump down, du -du -du -du. jump up, jump down jump up, jump down, jump up. So that's what your Fourier series is gonna do. We want to find the blue wave, right? Essentially, okay? That's what we care about, right? Now you don't have to draw the picture unless it says so. For, for us, we're never going to draw a picture. Sometimes in a, in, a, in a final that you have to write out in long form, you have to draw the picture, um, but it's not always required. Okay. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to find the blue guy. All right. Let's actually do something with this. How would we do it? Well, the 
This is a formula. I wrote it in a box, which means you should have it memorized. And of course, um, I, it goes without saying, but I really mean this entire thing is in the series. Okay, now what we need to do is we need to find the A ends and the B ends. So we're just going to go in and set A zero. A zero is going to be one over L. And what is L? Let me actually tell you what that is first. Uh, period is two. This means 2L is equal to 2, because we always assume our function is 2L periodic, which means that our L equals 1. This means if I go and find the A0, this is 1 over L, find the integral from minus L to L of f of x dx. Plug in L equals 1, um, this is just going to be the integral from minus 1 up to 1 of f of x dx. Well, what is that equal to? Well, on the interval from... Um, Minus one to zero, the function is zero. On the integral from zero to one, it is two. So this actually breaks up into two parts. From minus one to zero, it's zero. And from uh, zero to one, it is two. So of course, this part here is going to give us zero. This other part is just going to give us two x between zero and one, so it's two. And that's my a zero. All right, now I would need to find the an. An is, me, is minus one over L for integral from minus L to L of f of x times cosine n pi x over L. This is just going to be from minus one to one. Well, from minus one to zero of zero plus from zero to one of two times cosine n pi x over L. Now I'm going to integrate that. This is going to give me two, oh, and my L is one. So I'm, I'm plugging in the L. So this is going to give me two over n pi times the sine of n pi x between zero and one. Now, of course, if I take the uh, plug in one for x, this is two over n pi times sine of n pi minus sine of zero. Now, of course, both of those are zero. So that's zero, that's zero. So this means my a n equals zero. which is not completely surprising. It's almost like an odd function. It looks like an odd function that's shifted up by a half a unit. So the fact that there's no, uh, no cosine part uh, is not completely surprising. It seems to me like a shifted sine curve. If you look at the blue wave and you kind of made it more curvy, it would look like a sine curve, right? <laughs> Just uh, kind of shifted actually. So now uh, we would go with the BN. We know that this is one over L minus L to L of F of X sine of N pi X over L. This is going to be plugging in L equals one and knowing that from minus one to zero, it is zero. And from zero to one, the function is two and my L is one. That's the guy I have to find. So now um, this is going to be two over n pi times the negative cosine of n pi x between zero and one. This is minus two over n pi cosine of n pi minus one. Now, we know about cosine when n is even, our cosine of n pi is, what is cosine of n pi when n is even? Quickly. 
right, one. <laughs> he already saw. <laughs> But by the time I looked at the chat box, he typed in the answer. That's why I like to say he knew I was going to ask. Cosine of n pi is 1 for even n, which means uh, bn equals 0 for n even. When n is odd, what is the cosine of n pi? Well, it's minus 1. So cosine of 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi, et cetera, is 1. Cosine of pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, 7 pi, 9 pi, et cetera, is minus 1, which means in this case, my bn is going to be minus 2 over n pi times, well, minus 1 minus 1. So that's just going to be 4 over n pi. So for our function, the Fourier series is a zero over two, which is one, plus the series that only works for odd integers of four over n pi sine of n pi x. So that is actually the equation of that blue wave. And the higher I take n, um, the better that blue wave is going to fit. Uh, what do you mean cosine? Cosine is an even function. However, when n is odd, when n is odd, cosine gives me minus one. And when cosine of n pi is minus one, and when n is even, uh, the cosine of n pi gives you positive one. That's something you knew from pre-calc. That's not, that's a pre-calc thing. And you can know that by looking at the graph. Um, so that's our answer. That's the Fourier series for this function. That's the equation of the blue wave. And the higher I take n, the closer that blue wave is going to fit to that graph. Here's another example. So I'm going to modify this example just a little bit, just a little bit. So here's another kind of problem type that you will see. Right, or you can just think of it, there's no series for n even in the sense that the even terms give you zero. So it's like you'll have zero plus something plus zero plus something plus zero plus something plus zero plus something. And I just decided to ignore all the zeros because why? Why have them there? All right, so for n even, uh, it's going to be like zeros. So I just say that it's gonna be n odd. I could put in here even n as well, but it's, uh, I would have to include an extra term that talks about, oh, it's zero when n is even. So I, I just skipped it. All right, here f of x is two. So notice here that they just told me one wing of a function. They didn't tell me it's periodic or anything. And this is what they do sometimes. So they just told me, here's a function. It's uh, from zero to one, it's at the level of two. Now they told us extend as an even function, meaning you want to extend in such a way that it's symmetric about the y-axis. Now, if you were to extend it, this is what it would look like, right? To be symmetric. So the green, so uh, let me actually do that. Now, if I look at the extension, required extension, that'll just be the green going over here. And then uh, the, uh, the copies
would just be literally just doing that two times. And it's going to, it's going to, the, the left side of this is going to fill in that. And then I'm going to extend this again, fill in that, et cetera, and extend it again, fill in that. Right, and this is going every two units. So that goes to three, and then this one is going to happen at five, and et cetera. Okay. Parenthetical statement, we can see, tell me what this function actually is, like in general, what is that function? If I actually extend things the way that I was required to extend, what is the, what is the function that I would get? Don't even think Fourier series. Just look at that function. Tell me what function that, that is. It's just two, right? The function is two. Now, the problem asks us to find a Fourier series. Let's see if our Fourier series can approximate the number two. So we're gonna jump into it and see if our Fourier series approximates the number two. All right. A zero, what is that? Well, um, in this case, again, our L is going to be um, L equals two, uh, L equals one, since here it is two. So now I go in and I would have, well, it's going to now be uh, a zero is one over L integral from minus L to L of F of X. This case is going to be from minus one to one of two. It's two on that entire interval. And this is going to be, well, two X between minus one and one. That's going to give me four as the answer. Now I go down to a N. A N is one over L and integral from minus L to L of F of X cosine N pi X over L. This I can think of as two over L, zero to L of F of X cosine N pi X over L. Uh, we are an even function. So um, in fact, it means that the BNs are going to be zero. So I'm going to ignore the BNs later. Right now I'm going to plug in L equals one. The function is two. And L is one. So here I would have four over N pi times integral from zero to one of sine. Uh, The integral is sine of n pi x between zero and one. You realize that that gives you zero. We also know that our bn is zero because it's an even function. We just were told to extend it as an even series. So basically what I'm doing is I'm now computing the guy in uh, the box. This is, my, uh, this is my goal series at this point. I want to compute the cosine series of this function because I was required to extend it as an even function. So I know my BNs are going to be zero. My A zero is equal to four. My AN is equal to zero. So the function is A zero over two plus the series of AN cosine N pi X over L plus B N sine N pi X over L. Notice that the A N is zero and the B N is zero and this guy is four. What does that simplify to? Two. And voila, it actually is two, <laughs> right? So the Fourier series is like, hey, you don't need sines and cosines here. A very nice constant function is gonna give you what you want. So even if you're, you're applying a Fourier series and you don't need it, the Fourier series is gonna tell you, hey, you didn't need this. It's kind of like someone who goes to a polynomial and tries to find a power series. Like, dude, it's already a power series. Um, so yeah, I think that's neat. That's just an example of uh, 
So you can actually, I, I brought that example in because, so you can actually see with your eyes, you know what the answer should be. And your Fourier series actually coincides with what you know the answer should be. So that was nice. Um, now I'm not going to do this example. I want you guys to try it. And you guys can let me know. Do the odd version of this, meaning um, if you start out with this function, I want you to extend it as an odd function. So you start out here and I want you to extend as an odd function, which means it's going to look like this. And then it's going to cup in here and come in there, and cup here, come in there. And then it's going to start here, go there, it's going to start here, go there, etc. So that's the graph I wanted to create. It's an odd function, which means you should ignore the ANs, just focus on the BNs and compute the Fourier series for that. Try that one on your own time. Uh, in the meantime, I actually want to finish up by doing this last example. So this is actually from a departmental final. And this is actually part A of a two part problem. <laughs> so just to give you some perspective on, in general, the, the kind of uh, what you'll be expected to do. Like they expect you to be able to do this and then do another part just to answer this one problem. Okay, so this was from the fall 2011 final problem 10, part A. It says compute the sine series. So if you didn't read that correctly and you just jumped into Fourier series, you'd end up wasting a lot of time. So let's compute the sine series, meaning you're going to want to extend this as an odd function. Now, if you look at the graph of this function, um, not necessary to graph, but I'm just gonna show you. Um, between zero and one, uh, this is a, a parabola. It's x minus x squared, it's upside down, and the intercepts are zero and one. So essentially what this guy looks like is, he looks like a parabola that goes between zero and one. What this asks you to do is extend as an odd function, which means it wants you to attach to this, that part going to minus one, and then it wants you to repeat this pattern. Now notice what you're looking like. It looks like an artificial sine function, actually. So this is almost like we're going to rewrite a sine function, but it's not really a sine function um, because you know this behaves like a parabola. The arc, it's like a sine function where the arcs behave parabolic and not like a trig function. No, uh, as for solutions on the finals, no, I don't have any solutions. They're not even my finals, so. I mean, in general, I, I, I give my students all the resources that I have available, right? If, if, you, if you don't have a resource, it's because it doesn't exist. So if I gave you an exam, and I didn't give you the solutions, it's because there were no solutions written. At least not by me. I, I don't know where they are. Anyway, so that's what this is asking you. So the, the red is the original. Red is original. And the green is the extension. And then uh, this part here This is the principal period. Mm 
that's the part that gets copied over and over. Okay, so now I actually want to find a Fourier series for this guy, but only the sine series. So here, I know my a0 equals zero and my a n equals zero because we're looking for a sine series. Which means I will need to compute the bn's. What about the bn? Well, bn is one over l times integral from minus l to l of f of x sine n pi x over l dx, where our l is again one uh, because it's it's half the period. Okay. And so now let's actually look at what that would look like. Um, and in fact, we can use two over L from zero to L of blah, blah, blah. And that's what I'm going to use because it's an odd function. Okay, so this means that my BN is going to be equal to two times integral from zero to one of X times one minus X times sine of n pi x. And so now to compute this Fourier series of this function, the sine series, um, I am going to just actually compute this integral. So this actually just becomes, uh, maybe I can bring the two in just to do everything at once. This will look like 2x minus 2x squared times sine of n pi x. And what are we gonna do? Well, integration by parts, of course. Um, however, you would have to do integration by parts twice. And yes, this was on a final, they expect you to be able to do that. But if you know the tabular method, it's not going to be so bad. Um, differentiate that, I would get two minus four X. Differentiate that, I would get minus four. Differentiate that, I would get zero, so I stop. Um, integrate the sign, I would get mine, I would get minus one over n pi times the cosine. Integrate that, I would get minus one over n squared pi squared times the sine. And integrate that, I would get positive n cubed pi cubed cosine. Then I'm going to multiply these two, add them together. I'm going to multiply these two and subtract that. I'm going to multiply these two, add them together. Then I'm going to multiply across here and integrate, but that's just going to give me a plus C, which now is not relevant because it's a definite integral. So this integral will actually become minus two X, one minus x over n pi cosine n pi x. Just by multiplying across here and taking the positive sign and I factored out the two x. So multiply across here and I'm adding it. Then I'm going to subtract the next product here. I can factor out a two. So this is here would be two times one minus two X over, and it's a negative now, over N squared pi squared sine N pi X. Then I'm going to add uh, that last product which now becomes a minus four over n cubed pi cubed cosine n pi x. And all of this is between zero and one. So now I go in, I plug in, if I plug in one, this part goes to zero, the first term goes to zero. Plug in one here, I would get a uh, sine of n pi and that's going to go to zero. Plug in one here and I would end up with minus four over n cubed pi cubed 
cosine of n pi minus, now I go in and plug in zero. If I plug in zero for the x in the first term, I would get zero because of the coefficient. Plug in zero for x in the second term, I would get sine of zero, which is zero. And then the third term plug in zero, I just end up with cosine of zero, but then I end up with a minus four over n cubed, pi cubed, cosine of zero. So here I end up with uh, minus four over n cubed, pi cubed, cosine of n pi. And we can remember that that's just a fancy way of writing minus one to the n, or, or minus one to the n plus one, I guess you want to say. Um, so when our n is, no, minus one to the n. When our n is even, that guy gives me a plus one. When our n is odd, that guy gives me a minus one. So that's that. Um, then I would have plus a four over n cubed pi cubed. So essentially, this gives me um, four over n cubed pi cubed times one minus cosine n pi which just gives me four over n cubed pi cubed for well i would get eight so when my n is odd this guy becomes a negative one so that becomes a plus two so this becomes eight if n is odd and if my n is even well it gives me zero so this is my bn. So now that goes into my sine series. So the sine series is just going to be the series about going from n odd of eight over n cubed pi cubed sine of n pi x. And uh, that is the that is the solution to this problem. So that is uh, your sine series. Um, so yeah, a little bit long, but again, this was actually on a final. Um, you were expected to be able to do this. Um, if you did integration by parts twice with all the nested parentheses. Um, this part would take a little bit longer and uh, you can probably make some mistakes. I think the tabular method would be much better here. Um, at the end of the day, um, after computing these integrals, I end up with this. Um, another way you can do this is to say something like, just in case you see an answer choice in a different way, something like uh, n equals one to infinity, but you can force your n to be odd by writing it as something like two n plus one. So sometimes if you have something that only works for even, you can just write all your ends as two ends. If you have something that is only works for odds, you can write all your ends as like two ends plus ones. Or uh, I do want to, I want it to include one. So it starts at n equals one. So two n minus one would be the better option. And uh, there we go. Carnage, but yeah, remember, this is still problem 10, and it's a two-part problem. <laughs> this is 10A. So again, kind of goes without saying when I, I really encourage you guys to try things on your own. You really have to just crunch through a lot of problems, so to the point where you can actually go through this relatively quickly and not like lose a beat or, or get a panic attack or anything of that sort. Um, in that regard, and, and this is something I was mentioning to someone else, when it comes to practicing for the test, the homework is good. It does help you to delve deeper into things, but homework shouldn't be a part of your test practice. 
because you want to practice things that you can do at the same difficulty level as an exam would be and with speed and without a calculator. Your homework does not take any of this into account. Your homework doesn't care if you spend two days and use a calculator to actually crunch in the numbers. So you want to make sure that you practice from the exams that I gave you, the practice exams, the past finals, practice from the textbook, which has a lot of problems that they expect students to be able to do by hand. And you try to get through them very quickly. So you practice from the suggested problems. That's when you're prepping for an exam specifically, that's where you wanna be. Um, and I gave you all the information. You have more than enough practice to get through um, within the next couple of days. So you shouldn't have any time. Make sure you're practicing, you're timing yourselves while you're doing problems and all that good stuff. So you not only practice doing the problems, but you practice doing them quickly. So you, you, you're less likely to make mistakes or at the very least, you become aware of what mistakes you tend to make when you're rushing. So you know to look out for those on an exam. That being said, we're gonna stop here. That's everything that we need to know for Fourier, for Fourier series. Very important topic. No, today is not the last lecture. We're actually doing something else tomorrow. Today is the last lecture that would be tested on the test. What we're doing tomorrow is a part of our syllabus. It'll definitely be on your final, but it won't be an actual question in your test. What, uh, what I'm doing tomorrow, I will put like as a bonus problem on the test. So tomorrow we're gonna talk about the heat equation, which is a, a very a nice application of PDEs actually in, um, in heat conduction. So it's more of a physics application of partial differential equations. I'm gonna show you how to solve the heat equation. Very cool thing. Uh, Fourier had a lot to do with that, by the way. He developed the theory behind uh, the heat equation, solving the heat equation. All right. These guys you can check out if you're interested. I think it's pretty cool if you have some time. Um, yes. So the next test will be on Friday at noon. That being said, I do remember someone telling me that they can't make it at exactly that time on Friday. There was like one person, um, but I forgot who you were. So maybe you should email me and let me know. Because <laughs> I, I can't find the chat where they told me and yeah. Anyway, we are going to wrap up there. We're gonna stop there. We had some technical issues today, but ultimately we made it through. We're gonna stop there. Uh, Okay, we're almost on the last leg. So up to today is the last thing that you'll need for the test on Friday, which is going to be done between that 12 to three window, uh, just like last time on Gradescope. Um, it'll cover everything since the last test, everything up to today. Um, what we're gonna be learning tomorrow will be on the bonus problem. Okay, uh, and we're already, we're actually quite over time here. Um, we're over time by like 10 minutes or so. Any, anyway. I will see you guys in the next one. Stay safe, everybody. And yeah, see you in the next one. Ciao.